This is a humble DNA photocopying machine found in nature. Although it might look simple and boring, it is one of the most important pieces in understanding the puzzle that is human DNA, the blueprint that makes us who we are, our genome. In fact, this machine, DNA polymerase's main purpose is to simply copy DNA for cell division. But it is probably behind almost every recent biological advancement you've heard of, whether that be CRISPR-Cas9, the COVID test kits, genetic engineering, and so much more. Beyond just showing these wonderful things, I'll also be demonstrating how to use DNA polymerase in the setting of a real molecular biology lab. But first, how does this machine even work? DNA polymerase is just like any other molecular machine. They're known as enzymes. Enzymes need the proper structure to function properly, which is why the things that can affect this, such as the pH and the temperature, should be kept in the optimal range. If the temperature is too low, the enzyme won't move around enough to meet the other chemicals. If it is too hot, then the enzyme unfolds into strings. You can learn more about how we simulate this in one of my previous videos. Enzymes are also quite picky. DNA polymerase recognizes this particular structure of DNA. It can then latch on here and fill in the blanks with the complementary ink. This is how it copies DNA. Well, what if we throw a wrench into all of this and expose the other end of the DNA? As it turns out, DNA polymerase will only copy the end where the DNA has an OH on the third carbon sticking out and not the fifth. This is because the ink molecules themselves, DNTPs, get the energy to fuse to DNA from releasing negatively charged phosphates, much like how you'd get energy from releasing a clamped spring. These negative charges are on the five prime side, so that's why we only go from five prime to three prime. This also makes the entire DNA backbone negatively charged. And that's why in DNA polymerase, we have magnesium ions to stabilize this negative charge. So DNA polymerase is an enzyme that copies DNA when it sees half exposed DNA and only goes from five prime to three prime. Although this feels like a limitation, it's actually a pretty useful property we can exploit. Say we have a block of code we want to see work in isolation. To do that, we can somehow unzip this DNA into two strands and attach two smaller strands. These are called primers. This creates the wonky DNA we saw earlier, so it only goes in one direction. And after two rounds of copying, voila, we now have only the region we're interested in. But how do we even magically separate these strands in the first place? They're quite tightly bound together. The answer is pretty simple, heat. Just like how enzymes break down into strings at higher temperatures, DNA will also unzip. In fact, the whole replication process can be orchestrated using heat. One temperature optimal for separation, one for primer annealing, and one for DNA polymerase extension. But these temperatures are far beyond our own polymerases range, so we have to use one from hot spring bacteria instead. You typically run this loop 25 to 30 times, and this is what we call the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. It is arguably one of the most important reactions when it comes to working with anything related to DNA. PCR essentially makes the issue of scale almost irrelevant when it comes to DNA. If you have just one template, you can theoretically make a billion times more copies using PCR. This means endless opportunities to experiment around with the copy DNA, not, not having to worry about running out of your sample. Pretty useful when you're actively destroying DNA like in your CRISPR-Cas9 projects. Understanding your tools really well can lead to pretty creative ways of using them. So let's see this thing for real in the lab. PCR reactions are pretty simple to make. You just need your polymerase, the ink, the template you want to copy, your primers, and a special magic solution known as a buffer provided in the kit. Unfortunately, this is the pitfall I've also personally experienced when I came into a molecular biology lab, believing that 
such thing as magic exists. This solution is not special. It just contains things that will help PCR run successfully. We have Trispase to balance out the pH for the enzyme, magnesium salt, which is a necessary part of the polymerase and helps decrease the negativity of the primer so it binds easier, and ammonium, which disrupts the hydrogen bonding, which means the primers have to be really specific in order to bind. These two counteract one another, so optimization is needed. That's why it's easier to use the company's kit. This means that you can alter the functionality of your PCR reaction by changing and mixing these ingredients yourself. Put this in a fancy oven known as a thermocycler, load up the program, let it run, and go for lunch. While I'm on breaks, I usually take the opportunity to broaden my knowledge, not only through reading papers, but also through today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant is where you can learn by doing with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, and AI. The interactives on Brilliant help you build your critical thinking skills through problem solving, not just memorization, which will help you own the knowledge you've obtained. So while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you'll also become a better thinker. Brilliant recently launched a ton of new content in data. As you'll see soon, even in a life science related job, you still work with a lot of data. Data, which when analyzed, gives you wonderful insights into your experiments. These courses are perfect for learners of any level to start or continue learning data analysis. With a fully built out suite of new content from Bayes' theorem to multiple linear regressions. You'll also learn how to parse and visualize massive datasets to make them easier to interpret. Beyond that, you'll also gain real world insight by working with real datasets from sources such as Starbucks, X, Spotify, and more. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash nanorooms or click on the link in the description below. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Remember the exponential property of PCR? This means that even one DNA molecule can be amplified to billions, thus detected if you perform PCR on it. Although practically the limit of detection isn't that low, you still get the point. The exponential amplification ability of PCR, combined with the primary specificity for certain regions of DNA, makes it an extremely effective sensor. In fact, this is why it was used as an almost surefire way to diagnose COVID-19 back in the pandemic days. SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus. Once RNA is out of the virus, it becomes unstable. So, its RNA must first be converted to DNA using reverse transcriptase to stabilize it. If there's no virus, then these virus-specific primers won't bind onto anything, including human DNA, and nothing happens. Then we can perform PCR on the sample. This can indicate not only the presence or absence of DNA, but the amount of DNA in real time. But how do we see DNA that's invisible to the eye? The answer is that we add a dye. The brightness indicates the amount of DNA present. Fluorescence is one of the most important and common ways for us biologists to peer into the nanoscale world of biomolecules. This technique is known as RT-RT-PCR. RT stands for reverse transcriptase and RT stands for real time. Which one is which? I don't know. The added benefit is that the amount of DNA you've started with also tells you the amount of RNA you've started with, which also tells you the amount of virus you've started with. This can roughly tell the patient how far along they are on the disease. Pretty neat, huh? A more simple yet equally powerful way of using it as a sensor is that we can detect which variant of software is in each person's genome. Some people's codes are just longer than others, but the padding is the same. So we can detect which type of code the person has by designing the primers to match that padding. This is how DNA ancestry companies do use your ancestry without sequencing. Great, it can make a bazillion copies of things with very little starting material. How does this lead to understanding the human genome? Is that all there is to it? Well, no, because it is also the key towards editing DNA. The best way for a primer to stick to DNA is to be perfectly complementary. But is that always true? What if we add just one mismatch to it? As it turns out, this is very possible. So we can do a Trojan horse and sneak in extra sequences at the ends or in the middle of the primers. And over the cycles, they can be incorporated into the final product. 
These extra sequences can code for a deliberate mutation, or it can be a target site for DNA scissors. That lab experiment I've shown you earlier is actually designed under these principles. I wanted to swap two control blocks between bacteria, and so the primers were designed such that it would amplify the control region and the rest of the DNA separately. Each of these can be cut to create sticky ends, which can join together with the opposite backbone to complete the swap. This is a story for another day. But wait, if this whole thing didn't work, how do, would we know if the reactions were successful? I mean, it's all transparent liquid, so you can't actually tell. One very quick and easy way is to just separate the DNA out by size. This is done using an electric field and a gel. If the DNA is longer, it's going to move slower through the gel. We can compare the samples to a reference ladder and voila, we've just confirmed that we have the right DNA size. Time to move on to the cutting, pasting, and all the other steps down the line. Well, sure, size is a good indicator, but what if when we're all said and done, there were mutations or alterations in the sequence? That can greatly mess up our experiments down the line. And that is why we have to send our DNA for sequencing, which, you've guessed it, hinges on another clever use of PCR. Remember the whole 5' to 3' directionality? That's because you need 3'OH to attach the spring-loaded ink. Well, what if that 3'OH was gone? Nothing will be able to attach, right? So, what's the point? Well, what if we add only a small fraction of this malfunctioned ink into the mix? Most of the DNA will replicate just fine until it randomly jams because of the special ink. Since all of this is random, you'll get a termination at every point in the sequence, if you do it enough times. Well, this will just create a chaotic mess, as you can see. Unless you load it onto a gel to separate all of that by size. And if each of the special dye was pre-labeled with a different color for each letter, voila, sequencing. In fact, this method was so revolutionary that it earned Dr. Sanger his second Nobel Prize in chemistry. However, there is a limitation to this method, even in its modern upgrades. As you can see, separating DNA using electric fields gets progressively harder and harder the larger the DNA is. The resolution starts breaking down at around a thousand letters or so in the best case. But 1000 is nothing compared to the 6 billion letters in the human genome. Sequencing the human genome would cost more than an arm and a leg. It will take ages, heaven forbid, any other important organism. We can't even get past us humans. Something had to be done about this bottleneck. Well, my friends, as you can see on this graph, we can simply follow Moore's law since the early days of Sanger sequencing, and the cost would drop by a lot. $10 per 1 million letters isn't so bad after all. But... That is not the reality we live in. It doesn't cost $10, it costs a cent. This is the power of next generation sequencing. Sanger sequencing can only do 700 bases of DNA in one small tube. In one machine, it can do 384 samples at once. Next generation sequencing can do 300 bases per sample, but it can do 13 billion samples at once on a microscope slide. It works similarly to Sanger sequencing. DNA polymerase stops copying once it incorporates a specially dyed DNTP. Once we're done taking a photograph of that, a 3'OH blocker is removed and then the next special DNTP can come in, continuing the cycle. As you can see, you can take the photos of all the sequences at once, immensely boosting the efficiency of the process. But one DNA strand is too thin to see with a camera, so we first shear our sample DNA into many little pieces, add special sequences to both ends, you'll see why they're there in a second, and the DNAs can attach themselves onto a sea of special sequences at the bottom of the microscope slides. These can act as primers and allows us to amplify the amount of DNA, once again using PCR. Then we can start reading the sequences all at once. When we're done, we can piece sequences together using their similarity, and then we can assemble the whole genome. Even these amplified regions are still small enough to encompass the 13 billion unique sequences.
Exploring the genome of an organism can yield great insights into how it's going to function. But what if I say that next generation sequencing can allow us to go beyond the genome? How often each gene is activated is reflected in how much RNA of that gene is being transcribed. This is known as the transcriptome, and it can be measured with next generation sequencing using our old friend, reverse transcriptase. But that will have to be another story for another video. Next generation sequencing can truly bring our understanding beyond the level of DNA. Just as we've turned fire from a natural disaster into the spark of civilization, we've turned the machine that allows us to simply make more of ourselves into something that allows us to understand the nature of who we are. All because we have the curiosity to deeply understand how something works and the ingenuity to adapt it beyond its intended uses. This is what it means for me to be a scientist. This is what it means for me to be human.